Hello, everybody, and welcome to Schwab Coaching. My name is Lee Bowl, one of the uh, education coaches here at Schwab. Our next topic is Jeff's World with Schwab's Chief Global Investment Strategist, Jeffrey Kleintop. Morning, Jeff. Hi, Lee. How you doing? Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Yep. Before we can get to all of Jeff's insights today, just a few logistical items. So we want to hear from you. Put in those questions in the chat functionality. Also, we have some written disclosures we need to go through. So just keep in mind that everything we're doing today should be considered as educational and informational in nature only. Nothing is a personalized trading recommendation. Uh, regardless of what comments are made, remember markets can change. So uh, comments could be changing along with that. Uh, past performance, of course, is never guarantee of future success. Investing does involve loss of risk of principle. And we do not recommend the use of technical analysis as your sole method of investment research. So, Jeff, I'll start off like we usually do every week. Uh, let me know what you're watching. Yeah, it's a big week. Every day this week counts. We've got Super Tuesday. We've got Humphrey Hawkins Wednesday, an ECB meeting on Thursday, and of course, it's Jobs Report Friday this week. So there's a lot you need to know for every day of this week ahead. Of course, Tuesday is Super Tuesday in the U.S. You've got North Carolina, California, Texas, and a dozen more states holding primaries with probably little chance of a surprise there. On the same day, though, tomorrow, China kicks off its 14th National People's Congress. Big Super Tuesday there. It's That's its annual parliamentary gathering, all the bigwigs getting together in Beijing. And that might be more market moving since the, the National People's Congress is where China's leaders reveal their economic growth target for the year, which could be accompanied by announcements of added support for the property market that's currently weighing on China's growth. Normally, there isn't a press conference afterward. It's kind of an internal meeting, but there is one uh, when the premier is going to be a, a sort of announcing the takeaways from that meeting. So that could be a big one. Uh, that's followed on Wednesday by Fed Chair Powell, maybe the world's most important person, testifying before the House Financial Services Committee for his semi-annual so-called Humphrey Hawkins testimony. And it'll be in front of the Senate on Thursday. And that gives him an opportunity to signal to the markets his latest thinking on the timing of rate cuts. We've heard from different members of the Fed lately, some more on the hawkish side, some more on the dovish side. Powell kind of pulled that back to the center. We'll see where he falls. Also on Wednesday, we hear from another set Bank, the Bank of Canada, their meeting, they're likely to remain on hold after GDP growth surprised on the upside. In Q4, the economy did avoid a technical recession of back-to-back -back quarters of negative GDP, unlike some of its G7 peers, the UK, a um, few others. Still, a rate cut is on the horizon in Canada with full-time employment and spending on the decline and inflation also surprising on the downside. So we'll hear about that, uh, more about that at their meeting on Wednesday. Then Thursday, it's the European Central Bank meeting. President Lagarde has already said the ECB's next move is for a cut, but they're probably not ready to cut rates this week. Downward revisions to the forecast by the ECB staff economists are expected to come out, and that would support a cut at the next meeting in April, but she'll probably argue that policymakers can't move until they have more data on wages. The Q1 wage data is not due out until mid-May, so that would line them up with a June rate cut, pretty much what the market expects for most central banks, including the Fed. Speaking of the Fed, we get Friday's U.S. jobs report for February, and that's expected to show a gain of about 188,000 jobs, according to the consensus of economists tracked by Bloomberg. And that will show some signs of the labor market weakening after a blowout number in January of 353,000 jobs being created. Layoffs seem to be extending from the information technology sector to financials, to retail, and to the education sectors as well. And demand for temporary workers is down. That's often a leading indicator. The unemployment rate is also expected to edge up to 3.8% from 3.7, still very low. Uh, and uh, but but overall, I mean, I, it's still the net new job growth is still much stronger than Fed Chair Powell's estimated neutral pace of a hundred thousand jobs. So they're not looking. Fed's not looking to see job declines, and they'd like to see more neutral number around a hundred thousand jobs created each month. And of course, we're still likely to be well in excess of that. All right. Well, uh, from what I've been reading, it looks like we have maybe turned the corner on manufacturing, given some of the data. Uh, what are you seeing that way and why might it be important for us? 
Yeah, so different countries in, in different stages here of their manufacturing recovery. China is still looking fairly soft, but the Global Manufacturing Purchasing Managers Index. So this is from many many countries around the world, uh, summing up the the sentiment among business leaders in manufacturing. Hit fifty point three in February. That is the first reading above the neutral fifty point zero mark in eighteen months. So since August of 2022, signaling the end of the manufacturing recession that we talked about, the cardboard box recession we talked about uh, all last year. Now, this uh, rise in the new orders component of that survey signals more growth ahead, but you can see how long it's been. We had the deepest, the longest uh, cardboard box recession, if you will, that we've ever seen in the data. This data goes back about 30 years for the global manufacturing PMI, uh, although the U.S. one goes back to the 1920s. You can see here that uh, those, this, I'm just tracking here sequential months, growing or contracting. Usually it doesn't flip from growth to contraction one month to the next. We trend either in growth or either in contraction. And that 16, 18 months in a row of negatives, really a long period of time to see declines there. So we're only one month into a recovery here. January is exactly 50.0. Now February 50.3. Nice to see some green on the screen. I expect that'll continue, maybe not a V-shaped recovery, but uh, continued movement in a positive direction. So that's encouraging. Um, what about the supply chain issues? Could they cause problems for this? I know we've talked about the shutdowns of the Panama Canal, the Suez Canal, uh, as a result of the, the Gulf Sea, Gulf of Aden issues with the Houthi rebels, um, and the sudden rise in costs from the expected shortage of shipping capacity uh, as ship is, ships are just taking longer to get where they're going <clears throat> is a risk. But <clears throat> I should point out that we have started to see shipping prices begin to roll back down again. And, and this is important. So we really saw them pick up in January and February. Uh, you can see in this chart here, nothing like we saw during the supply chain uh, crunch in this chart. <clears throat> By the way, this, this tracks some of the popular shipping routes in the world, essentially from Asia, from China, Shanghai in particular, uh, to New York, to the, west, to the East Coast, to the West Coast, and then to Rotterdam in Europe. All of them went up, not just to Europe, even though uh, we did see uh, uh, the, 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 maybe the, the biggest risk here in the, in the short term uh, in, in the uh, ships moving through the Suez Canal because of those Houthi rebel attacks. So the point is, maybe we're past the worst of this now. Maybe we're starting to see some of these supply chain pressures begin to ease and, and having prices come back down. So that's good news. I should note, however, though, there is a seasonal trend to this after we get past the holidays and past the... Um, uh, uh, Lunar New Year, we often see prices come down a little bit. So there's a seasonal element to this. The seasonal has been thrown out of whack in recent years by the incredible surge in costs and, and then coming back down again through the pandemic. But uh, maybe there's more to this than just a seasonal decline. And so on that front, it's worth noting that German inflation slowed in February. In fact, uh, we, uh, we saw it moderate in both France and Spain. And the German national inflation release, which doesn't contain a reading of underlying dynamics, but we can put one together. If we look at all the different states in Germany, they report all their data together. We can kind of sum up all the components of inflation within Germany. And what we can see is that transportation costs really didn't tick up very much. So in this chart, green is transportation. It went up a little bit, but they're not driving up overall inflation. This is not a huge turnaround in the direction of inflation here. Transportation costs remain relatively contained despite the rise in seaborne costs due to the rerouting of those ships. And if already we've seen that cost peak, then maybe the impact of overall inflation is going to be very, very minor if indeed it did peak. So that's relatively good news here as we look at some of the areas of the world that are most affected, like Germany. All right. Well, you had mentioned in your opening remarks about the uh... Bank of Canada and European Bank, uh, ECB rather, meeting this week. Uh, from what I can tell, the market has been uh, pushing back the outlook for rate hikes this year to all major banks. Cut, what cuts. can we expect? Yeah, cuts, right? And what can we expect the first cut and what might that mean for stocks? Yeah, it's hard to shift from talking about hikes for so many years to cuts. <laughs> I, all the time I'm writing and going, oh, wait, backspace. Nope, that should be cuts, not hikes. Uh, the market's outlook for rate cuts this year now I think is starting to stabilize at levels that we saw back in November. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, I think it probably settles in here 
at around three or four rate cuts this year for most of the world's major central banks, down from expecting six at the beginning of the year. And it's interesting to see that uh, how this has shifted. So uh, there's I put together this chart. It's on my, my Twitter, my LinkedIn. Uh, pretty often here, you can see how at the beginning of the year, this is the Bank of England, the Fed, and the European Central Bank. So this is looking at futures markets and what they're pricing in for rates at the end of the year, sort of how many rate cuts are they expecting? And uh, pricing that, that was six rate cuts uh, is what they were pricing in. That's come down to around three now, maybe three or four, depending on where you're looking, uh, maybe closer to two uh, for the Bank of England. So I think this is making more sense to me in terms of how stubborn inflation is. Uh, it's coming down, but it's not coming down at a super rapid pace. Inflation is not likely to get below 2% uh, uh, soon in, in the US, for example, or in the UK. And so, you know, expecting a more moderate three to four rate cuts this year, I think makes a lot more sense. So I don't expect this to continue to decline. I think this will begin to level out here. Um, and, you know, I, I think it makes sense that Europe may continue to lead uh, in terms of the number of rate cuts this year. Maybe I, I mentioned April still a possibility there. Uh, you know, you've had uh, Europe in recession in the last couple of quarters, so uh, that's a factor as well. In addition to the declining uh, number of uh, of rate cuts here, um, what it means for stocks is a different story. So for the U.S., for Europe, for Canada, and other countries, stocks have been mixed during the six months after the first rate hike. This is important because there's a lot of enthusiasm around, you know, can't wait till we till we get to some rate, I'm sorry, first cut, I said hike, cut. Uh, and this chart shows that for the Eurozone, where it's been down all three times when rates were cut over the past 25 years that the Eurozone existed, uh, but at least that's partly because these were periods where rate cuts were needed. The economy was suffering a recession, if not a crisis, back in 2001. The world suffered from the dot-com bubble bursting in a global recession in 2008. Of course, it was the global financial crisis and the ensuing recession. And then in 2011, Europe fell into a debt crisis centered on Greece and other Southern European nations, and Europe experienced a recession then as well. In 2024, we actually see growth improving in Europe after a recession in 2023, as does the International Monetary Fund, the OECD, and the consensus of economists tracked by Bloomberg. So the outcome may be different this time and arguably better, but just because the central bank starts to cut rates doesn't necessarily mean stocks are off to the races. All right, um, let's turn our attention to China. You mentioned that too, that they're having their big meeting, I think you said starting tomorrow. What is the potential for new tariffs there and restrictions on trade, uh, even ahead of the election where it's probably gonna be uh, a talking point, uh, which is just six months away that election. What impact might this have on markets and uh, central bank policymakers' decisions? Yeah, this is this is gonna be a big deal for the next six months uh, as, uh, you know, as, as you know, both presidential candidates uh, focus uh, more and more on, on China. You know, foreign and trade policy is really in the purview of the executive branch. So we'll hear a lot more about this. And so concerns about tariffs, what does it mean for growth? What does it mean for inflation? Uh, I've seen estimates uh, by economists that global GDP growth would weaken and inflation would rise 1% or more. So global economic growth falling 1% or more, inflation rising 1% percent or more in response to the tariffs already being proposed by candidate Trump. But let's consider a few things before we jump to any conclusions about the impact of growth or inflation uh, from any, any tariffs. First, no deglobalization has taken place since the trade war began during the Trump administration. The drop in imports from China by the U.S. was exactly offset by the increase in imports to the U.S. from Vietnam, Cambodia, and Thailand which was exactly how much more China exported to those three countries. So we're really just importing the same stuff from China. It's just passing through other Asian countries' ports first. So the economic impact really isn't there. You can kind of consider it trade laundering, if you will. Uh, it's just passing through a different country. So there wasn't really uh, major economic consequences uh, as a result of that. Same thing with other countries uh, like, like Mexico. So there really isn't a growth or much of a related inflation issue so far because we really haven't seen 
uh, a, a, you know, a shift to domestic production. We haven't really seen uh, shortages of goods as a result. None of that's really happened. And, and it's very muted. I it would continue to be, I think, very muted uh, under the, the types of uh, uh, proposals that are being unveiled by, by the candidates. Second, the Biden administration's tone on China may be more moderate compared with the heights of the Trump era, but its direction's largely been the same. Uh, as Biden's national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, recently said, the administration inherited Trump's firmer approach and built on it. They retain many Trump era policies, including China tariffs, and they expanded others like restrictions on China's access to U.S. technology. So it's not like, you know, with, with Biden, there's no impact. And with Trump, there is. There's still quite a bit uh, that we'd face under either uh, a candidate for uh uh, for, for her election. Biden has so far signed fewer executive orders targeting China than Trump did, but they've been many more far-reaching. One of the most significant establishes a mechanism to screen certain U.S. venture capital investments in China. That's been uh, somewhat controversial and impactful. Another is expected soon on blocking foreign adversaries access, uh, including China's, to sensitive U.S. consumer data. Uh, like we've recently been talking about with cars. So in other ways, Biden's beaten Trump's record. His administration has sanctioned and blacklisted more Chinese entities to date, and a majority of those actions took place just in 2023, when the Biden administration was also working to restart diplomacy with Beijing after a spike in tensions over that spy balloon. Uh, so Biden's uh, you know, th there's quite a bit going on. I mean, you know, Biden signed, I think it was back in December of 2021, there was the uh, Forced Labor Prevention Act, which banned goods made in Xinjiang. And then in October of 2022, the administration imposed sweeping restrictions on China's access to semiconductors, right, and the equipment used to make them really high-end semis, uh, which could have defense applications, and it updated them last fall. So, you know, there's a lot going on. Uh, so China's already braced for more measures from the Biden administration uh, ahead of the election and more from Trump in 2025 should he win. No matter who comes out ahead in November, U.S. pressure on China is unlikely to ease. But so far, those pressures have not resulted in an end to globalization, uh, impacting growth and inflation, but have prompted an escalating battle over subsidies. And if that means more capital spending and production, then it could mean more growth and less inflation. So there's a lot to watch over the coming year. I'm not convinced that campaign talk about big tariffs will necessarily result in those exact tariffs, nor that they'll be implemented in a way that can't be avoided in a number of ways or that will definitely lead to slower growth or definitely higher inflation. So I'm not jumping to any conclusions yet, despite all the talk. All right, let's talk about uh, some of the markets then. So uh, looking at the markets around the world, the U.S. and China stand out from the rest for different reasons. What do you make of that? Yeah, it's true. There have been two outliers in the global stock market, the U.S. and China. Emerging markets ex-China, so that's all the emerging markets, just excluding China, and developed markets ex the U.S. So all the developed markets, excluding the U.S., uh, are the two blue lines on this chart. And they performed pretty much the same. So emerging markets and developed markets pretty much have performed exactly the same for the last five years. That may be a surprise. You take out the U.S. And you, from, from developed, and you take out China from emerging, pretty much all the world's markets have behaved pretty similarly over the last five years, given the pandemic was global and, 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 and you know everything else, uh, the manufacturing recession was global, all this stuff. The U.S. is, that's the green line, They're, the U.S.'s exposure to high-flying tech and AI stocks has helped it outperform since early 2021, while China's, in red, lingering COVID and property problems over the same period have weighed on its relative performance. So it's really interesting to kind of see how the world has pretty much been uh, very similarly performing versus uh, the U.S. And, and China. But a different story emerges if we examine the performance since the bull market began at the end of October of 2022. So slice this period up a little bit. The U.S. has performed in line with other developed markets since October of 2022, since the bull market began, while China got off to a strong start, but that performance very quickly eroded. Uh, okay. Uh, well, you mentioned maybe one of the reasons the U.S. market on the previous chart had done well was, uh, you know, the tech exposure. Can we talk a little bit about uh, this AI movement and in your opinion, is it a bubble or how is it different than, 
you know, tech stocks in, let's say, 1999. We all know what happened after that. <laughs> yeah, we get a lot of questions about, you know, is this just like the late 90s all over again? Uh, and history shows that soaring performance and excessive valuations can leave stocks vulnerable to disappointment. But is the surge in AI-related stocks just another classic investing bubble? Uh, I, you know, I, I think bubbles typically are identified after they've popped, but there is a repeating pathway characterized by a specific set of conditions that help predict them. Uh, investment bubbles often begin as a natural byproduct of extremely stimulative policies enacted in the wake of global recessions. They are born of easy money, grow on speculation fueled by a strong fundamental theme and high investor confidence, and then they collapse as money tightens, usually well after disconnecting from intrinsic value. The specific set of conditions that characterize the start of a classic investment bubble, to me, don't, don't, they don't appear to be present. You know, maybe the meme investing craze of 2021, when the stocks of trouble companies like GameStop jumped from $1 to $81 was the classic bubble of the 2020s easy money cycle when rates were zero and quantitative easing was in full swing along with abundant government aid to consumers and businesses. But since then, central banks have hiked rates aggressively. The money supply in most major economies is contracted. Uh, it doesn't appear that easy money is giving rise to the surge in AI stocks. That doesn't mean AI stocks can't retreat, but it suggests the rise in AI stocks may not just be another one of the classic bubbles that have almost always ended in disappointment for investors. Other differences to prior bubble areas include how many stocks in the dot-com mania were not profitable and were rapidly burning through their cash in contrast to the very solid earnings and high cash holdings of the current AI leaders. You know, AI continues to be a hot topic on earnings calls. I put together this chart, just updated over the weekend, shows how many mentions of AI are showing up in earnings calls by business leaders. And it's still a pretty hot theme, right? So you can see where ChatGPT was unveiled there uh, late in, uh, in Q4 of 2022. And it's really exploded since then. So business leaders are really talking about the application of AI in their businesses. We haven't seen a lot of investment yet. Uh, but but we have seen a lot of intention in that area. And technical, technological innovation has been a key driver of global economic growth. It improves productivity and output uh, for centuries now. And, and business investment is likely to climb as the benefits of AI to their businesses become more evident, offering the potential for a productivity payoff maybe in the second half of this decade. AI-related stocks may benefit from all the increase in capital spending that's likely and provide an opportunity for investors as these firms look to improve their business processes. So the benefits of AI adoption may prompt markets to shift from a focus on the companies providing AI tools to those most effectively implementing them across different industries. Portfolio diversification remains important given the heightened volatility that often accompanies new technologies and likely shifts in leadership as technology and adoption evolve. So while I wouldn't put the AI stock boom as a classic bubble, remember, you know, money's been tightening lately, so it's just not in that classic framework. Nevertheless, the stocks could be vulnerable here. I'm more excited about AI long-term in its implementation, uh, more so than, than the company is currently developing the tools and, and solutions. Uh, so that, that's what I'm looking for, uh, for forward to, uh, sort of a broader AI theme affecting markets over the coming years. And, and in fact, if you go on Schwab.com, there is an AI theme, uh, which you can check out. Uh, and there are stocks tied to that, which are, I think, very interesting. Interesting. Um... All right. Well, we got some questions that have come in. Uh, the first one is, uh, what do you think the S and P is going to do uh, for the rest of this second quarter? I have no idea. Uh, and no one does. Uh, I mean, trying to predict the stock market on a short-term basis is, is very difficult. I'd, I'd advise against it. But I, I think, you know, if I had to measure and, and balance the risk versus the rewards in the second quarter, I would say that we are in a global manufacturing recovery. That's good news. I had been worried that the recovery in manufacturing around the world would be accompanied by 
a, a more dramatic slowdown in the services side of the economy as employment weekends and we see it end to like the summer tour schedule. Remember, a lot of things are driven by, you know, Taylor Swift and, and the summer tours and tourism. Uh, and that has has slowed, but hasn't slipped into a, into a sharp downturn. So global economic growth is improving. Earnings growth is also improving. I think we'll hear more upward uh, uh, revisions. In fact, we're seeing the lowest number of downward revisions to earnings this time of year than we've seen uh, at any time in the last 12 months. So, you know, the earnings trend is improving. The economic backdrop is firming up. So I'm excited about markets where valuations aren't discounting that, where they're below average. I'm finding that more overseas, in Japan, in Europe, uh, more attractive earnings multiples as they were pricing in a negative outlook and the outlook is improving. In the U.S., the price earnings multiple is 32% above its its 10-year average. And I'm worried about it. It's very expensive. And so the markets are pricing in already a very robust recovery in earnings and the global economic picture. So I'm a little more worried about that. I think that the, the pluses and minuses are much more balanced for the S&P 500 than they are for the rest of the world's markets. And that's why I continue to favor markets like Japan, like the Nikkei 225 index. I think that'll continue to outperform the S&P 500 uh, in part because in improving global earnings uh, and, and economic momentum, but accompanied with valuation that weren't discounting that that are likely to rise at the same time. Oh, okay. Another question. With our stock market still doing very strong and the economy showing not a lot of signs of weakening, do you think that this talk of rate cuts is actually premature, that they won't do anything or actually have to raise again? There is a risk of that. Uh, and we've been for a long time saying, you know, we sort of penciled in three, maybe four rate cuts this year. And we thought the market had really gotten ahead of itself when it was when it was pricing in six. Uh, we just don't see an inflation environment in the U.S. that would really prompt the Fed to be that aggressive. Inflation's probably not going to be below 2% in the U.S. for quite some time. Remember, that's the Fed's target. So it's going to be above target. Hard to see the Fed cutting rates, uh, you know, dramatically when when inflation is still above target still that said you know rates over five percent are probably more restrictive than the fed needs them to be uh in the second half of this year so I, we still expect some rate cuts but there are risks to that uh it's possible the fed would have to hike in the event of you know more of these supply chain disruptions that I'm talking about. Yes, it looks like they're they've peaked out in terms of their impact on inflation in the near term, but they could get a lot worse. Uh, there are a number of different challenges uh, remaining in the Suez and the Panama Canal that could continue to. Uh, cause container ship shortages, container shortages themselves that would uh, cause a further spike in shipping costs. Remember, shipping costs are only at 1% of the co final cost to produce a good or to, or to deliver a good. But when they're going up 500%, that can deliver more inflation, right? At the same time, you know, labor costs could continue to remain very stubborn. We're uh, in the middle of uh, labor negotiations in Japan, they're called the Shinto wage negotiations. We're seeing them in, in Europe as well. And then in the US, labor has remained very sticky. So remember, you know, 70% of the cost of producing a good is labor. So if those costs remain fairly high, uh, uh, then that could also uh, uh, prompt inflation to remain very sticky. And of course, in the U.S., we've got the housing issues as well, keeping prices high. So there are a number of reasons why inflation uh, could remain a challenge. And the Fed may not, and other central banks may not be as aggressive uh, as the market expects in, in bringing rates down. I think the market is now a bit more sober in their estimation of how many rate cuts are likely this year, uh, not likely to start until you know we get closer to the second half of the year, maybe in the second half of the year, and then and then maybe just 25 basis points at a time. Maybe even there's a meeting where they get skipped in there. So I think that's a more realistic assessment, but there is still some risk that it might be slower than that uh, and that inflation may remain more stubborn and tick up a little bit. In fact, I think over the next several years, that is likely that inflation follows a more volatile path than we've been used to in the past. And that keeps the Fed on its toes and may even need to hike rates again uh, in the, you know, in the visible future, a couple of years from now. Uh, and I have a number of charts on my X feed and, and on LinkedIn just showing the pattern of inflation and how, in fact, we could be in a higher and more volatile period for inflation in the years to come, not just in the U.S., but globally. So, you know, the market's idea that we're going to get aggressive series of rate cuts are going to go down and rates are going to stay low for the rest of the decade. I'm not sure that's uh, that's likely the case. So 
staying on your toes in this market, I think, is going to be fairly important. And looking for markets that are not pricing in a return to monetary normalcy, uh, again, outside the U.S. I think there's uh, Japan's going to be hiking rates this year. I think there's more uh, more of a sober look at, at what central banks are likely to do. I think the U.S. is maybe still optimistically taking a look at the flood of liquidity coming back to the markets from the Fed and how that's going to support valuations. And I'm just not so sure. All right. Well, dovetailing on your just the last statement there about uh, the, the money in the market, um, we, we have a client is asking, uh, is there still a lot of uh, liquidity from the 2020 injection? Uh, he's noting that, you know, in one year, the money supply went up 26 percent back then, and it's only dropped by a couple of percent now. Is there still that more than ample liquidity in the market that's f- fueling some of this? The way we look at it is the change. So yes, there was a surge and and that money is still in there, but it's not growing at the same pace. So we tend to look at the change in in the money supply or in liquidity and and how markets are functioning, uh, financial conditions uh, over the last 12 months or even over the last rolling three to six months, rather than looking at did it spike up and has it come back out again? So the slower pace over the last year, particularly over the last three to six months, is noteworthy. And so, no, I don't think we're seeing the same type of liquidity-fueled uh, binge. We're not seeing that much money sloshing around the system looking for a home. Uh, we're also not seeing that same type of binge of money into businesses and consumers being spent at the same pace. Consumers are borrowing on their credit cards. Uh, they're they're out, still out spending their income, but not to the same degree they were back in, let's say, 2022 or, or even early 2023. So that's faded as well. So no, I don't think we're seeing as much of that liquidity-driven support to the markets. I would say that we're not seeing it drained excessively either. Uh, so let's say the reservoir was filled. It's not continuing continuing to be filled, but it's not being drained at a rapid pace either. And so uh, what I think we're seeing right now is maybe um, uh, uh, you know conditions that are, aren't maybe fueling liquidity f- fuel bubbles, but at the same time, they're not popping them either. Uh, and, and again, it's going to be a real balance for the world's central banks to get this right. If they're all moving in the same direction at the same time, there is a risk that they lower that liquidity reservoir too rapidly and that that has valuation impacts for the world's markets. Many markets are braced for that. Again, the U.S. is not. All right. Well, our time is up, unfortunately. Thank you so much for sharing your insights this week. And we shall catch you all next week. So thank you all for your kind attention. Thanks for your engagement. Thank you, Jeff. And take care, everybody. Bye-bye.